today. So I know it's been, uh, we're putting out about one episode out a month right now, so uh, bear with us. We're going into the winter, so maybe it'll, it'll force us to be inside a little more, you know, trapped in front of our computers, but but probably not. So, but anyways, uh, glad you could be here with us. And uh, Kai, why don't you uh, tell us what's going on with you and who our guest is today? Uh, yeah, everything uh, everything with me is not too bad. And I was just getting back into the groove of, of things uh, out of my little funk. Um, still catching up with a lot of work, but uh, yeah, you know how that goes. It's never it's never ending. Right after this, I got to get back to it again. So we're uh, glad uh, we're able to get uh, Chris Foley on. Um, yeah. uh, welcome, man. I think I've uh, known you for a like, couple years Happy or so, you. right? Um and uh, Chris uh, really is, uh, I guess we're connect- we were first connected by Dave Urbanowicz. So then, then um, you know, yeah, we yeah. kind of just, all three of us, or, or especially them two, trade mangrove monitors back and forth. So, um, and then I just get to see them, you know, all the different ones and things like that. So um, that's how me and uh, Chris really got to get to know each other through the Indicus Complex. I honestly do work with a couple other monitors, and I'm familiar with some of them, but uh, mostly the harder species that basically many people can't do or get to get going. Um, we try to, you know, work on on those species together. So, you know, like Melanis and the the Salvadori project you got going on. I mean, I've never I'm scared of croc monitors, but hey, man, I'm really <laughs> yeah. Help whichever way, uh, whichever way is possible, and uh, that's why uh, we have Chris here today. Um, not not to burst anybody else's bubble or anything like that, because you know there are a lot of somewhat successes as far as the United States and growing with uh, our success rate on all the difficult stuff like Salvadori. Right? Um, Chris has been able to get some eggs this time, a, a decent clutch, right? Um, how many how many eggs were you able to get this time? Yeah, we got eleven this time, and uh, right now eight are still hanging on pretty good. Nice, nice. very nice. How how yeah. far along are they now? We are about ten weeks. Mm-hmm. I think Monday will be ten weeks. Nice. Man, has it already been ten weeks? That man, time's time's been going by so fast. It's so funny because it feels like she laid them yesterday, but it also feels like they should be hatching yeah. now. I can't decide. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we don't really know no, how long. Like, forever in no time. All how, how long is their how is their incubating period? Is it like a typical one seventy, or is it like into two hundred days? Uh, I don't know that there's been enough out there to really tell. Like when the when the Crutchfields had their parthos, they incubated both differently and got two drastically different incubation times on them. And then when um, when Jake got his, I want to say he was in the two hundreds because he he incubated a bit cooler at like eighty two, eighty three degrees. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, I, and I'm just about there. I'm I'm at like eighty three five to eighty four, so I, I would anticipate some extra time too. Yeah. yeah. So you I'll know, take before days. all that, real quick, Chris, so that everybody knows, every I say everybody like we have a ton of listeners. <laughs> all ten of us know. Um, tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself. Just what, what do you do? How long you've been doing it? Where's your passions? I know it's it's varied, so. Um, just to catch us all up, because this is the first time we were talking right before we began. This is the first time we've actually had a conversation, talking in person. I feel like I've talked to so many people around you that I felt like I talked to you, but then realizing, oh man, we really haven't <laughs> talked about anything before. So um, give us a little background on, on what you what you do, how long you've been in it, and all that. Uh, gosh, I've... I'm about, I think this is year 22, um, which is what kind of made the, the croc monitor so exciting. Like after 20 years to then have the pinnacle yeah. 
of of your keeping exists that far in. Uh, just that there's always more to pursue and more excitement to come. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. Um, the Crocs are definitely my favorite. I've got six of them. Jeez, six of them? <laughs> and uh, hopefully, yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> um, but I've, I've got some Melanus, which are actually courting right now, but I'm going to have to hit you up with some pictures, Kai, because I don't know what the heck she's doing. We're going to have to play some guesswork. All right. She's still, she's still eating like a pig, and he's still chasing her, but... It's uh, it's been a longer process than with the the Salvador. I, yeah, it is. It, it, um, trust me, man. There, the Indicus stuff is just so. I don't know. That's why nobody does them, or well, whoever tries, they you know, kind of give up after a few years, or or they give up very soon. Within a year, I've seen people give up. Um, and it, you know, it's not that. It's just the fact that indica stuff are just so you know they're mean to each other they're hard at telling telling signs um you know they're very shy so even working with them on a keeper animal basis is hard so because you can't really get a whole lot but yeah it's uh it's tricky man it's tricky i hope i hope we crack that one and you, you get at least one good clutch you know um I, I, what's weird is I think what what does it for me with was that no sorry go ahead oh, I thought I talked over somebody <laughs> now I say what what does it for me with that stuff is this is all stuff that I would keep even if I was never successful yeah. so like when I got into the the croc monitors I was very much like I I love these things more than any other reptile if I never get an egg a day in my life they're all going to stay here so there's no fail 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 let's get frustrated and quit if i fail I, I fail i still enjoy the next day going in their cage and sitting down with them like that's that means more to me than than any of this stuff yeah yeah um <laughs> which i think is kind of you know why the melanist are there dorianus are there uh, all stuff that I, I don't know if i'll ever get the breed but i i just love it and i have some some indicus too which you know, as, as successful as you've been and, and how helpful you've been to me, I, hopefully when they're mature, we can get those going here too. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're uh, tough, man. I, I, well, I wonder why you're not getting, you know, people go through the motions. Some people don't do jack at all. You know, like they're not effortless. How much effort we put into it, they're just not even trying, right? And they get eggs. So <laughs> it's like uh, I'm wondering yeah. what's keeping yours from dropping eggs, just to drop it, you know what I mean? Just because you'll go through the year. You've had them for more than a couple of years, right? And so they're, uh, they're, bound, to just, yeah. they're bound to just drop eggs regardless, cause, especially because the male's around and they go through the motions. Maybe we got to feed them more? Well. If yeah, it's, gonna... it's possible because when when I got those croc eggs, I've never fed a lizard that much in my entire freaking life. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I gotta wonder if that if that really contributes to it, and maybe I wasn't doing enough. Yeah. Um, that indicus in the past has had an infertile clutch. I just haven't had a male uh, mature enough to introduce to her. Man. Six croc so monitors. I'm still trying to wrap my head around six year, croc hopefully. monitors, but <laughs> if there's some missing hitchhikers somewhere around where you're at, I would. Uh... <laughs> what What do you? I know. Right? <laughs> what do you feed those animals on a consistent basis? What are you doing? Uh, just a, a really big berry diet. Um, I work for Cold Blooded Cafe, so I, I have access to a lot of rodents. Yeah. Um, you know, depending what time of year it is, I, I don't like to do. Oh, sorry, I don't, I don't like to do uh, exclusive rodents. I think it can be a little fatty at times, so that's when I'll try to switch to birds and yeah, fish. And I've done some crustaceans, and I really just try to vary it as much as I can. Uh, and, and sometimes try to base it on the areas that they're from since they're they're opportunistic and will really grab anything that moves in front of them. Yeah. But it's uh 
it's not a cheap bill. Even even with the, the cold blooded cafe help, even just buying all the other stuff, it's not it's not cheap. No, it's not. I mean, I go through a, like maybe every time I feed, I go through a little bowl full of chicks and crawfish and shrimp. Like it's you know, and it's three or four times a week, and into into heavy breeding season. And then when I'm done and I cut them off, I'm like, yeah, I don't have to feed you guys so much. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's just, it's a lot. And uh, I take my time with uh, the chicks, too. I I see my monitors preen, preen the chicks, right? They're trying to pull off feathers. And so I end up just removing, yeah. I, I remove most of the down feather, you know? Um, and so that way they're not preening it and they eat it a lot more efficiently and at the same time when they go poop right those micro hairs become dust in the cage that i don't have to deal with if i preen the 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 little chicks myself so you know when i end up and it's i never thought of it yeah when way. i end up no longer in breeding season i was like yeah i don't have to sit here 10 minutes pulling off feathers you know like um yeah man the things you do for your monitors man um but yeah, get, uh, getting back to um, you know everything about what you got going on, like uh, there's a good 20, 25 monitors you have at, at your place now, or is there more? Yeah, just about. So I've, I've got those Kimberly's from you. Um, I just got another female from Zach Minter and, and Trey, so there's a trio of those. Um, I've got four Sambawa waters that are from John Dragna and Chris Murray um, and one little Celebensis uh, that I got from Jay I don't, I don't know where it came from originally but he's a, a really cool little thing um, and that's like the, the pro and con of, of what I do is I have like a little bit of everything which is really exciting it keeps the hobby interesting for me uh, but like you and I have talked about a few times it sometimes pulls away from my focus and maybe yeah. why I miss some details. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because then there's another, I don't know, 120, 130 snakes. Oh, right. right. And they're not little snakes. They're like giant colubrids too, right? So, yeah, they're, they're, they're not little. That's a, that's a whole lot going on, man. I have no idea how you do that. Like, uh, I mean, every day, obviously some of the animals – you know, they're not work every day, but it's when it is time to get everybody done, that seems like a whole lot. And for me, um, I've actually had to kind of cut back on everything. It's not that I am trying to just hang out more or just, you know, chill more, but the workload for the grasshoppers has taken up so much that I've had to make space, you know, get rid of some of the Kimberleys that I was holding back and things like that and just uh, kind of go from there, right? And, uh, yeah, man, it's, it, I don't know how you do it with 20-plus, uh, 30 monitors on top of 100 snakes. That sounds like Alan right there. Well, Alan's <laughs> got 20 I think, monitors. Uh, I think what's, what's done it for me was back when I had that, that Regal Cinemas job and I was traveling, that's when I was looking to, to really cut back on things because I wasn't home all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, but since having – this position here it's it's been a lot easier just because the, the schedule is kind of flexible i work closer to home um i have some animals on their property so desiree's been uh, really flexible with me allowing me to to use some of their space like for these crocs um and kind of work around that schedule to do what i need to do when i need to do it as long as i'm getting my work done so i think that's uh yeah. kind of aided the obsession to, to keep the expansion where it is <laughs> man I've uh, yeah trying to keep up with that I've, I've had to reconsider especially this year uh, talking to a few people it's just well this is kind of getting off on a tangent real quick but um, you know whatever you think they, they, there's stuff going on in our economy right now and uh, prices of things are all over the place with certain like food items or other things going on. Um, so it's and and animals sometimes aren't selling as quick as they did when everybody was in their house, you know, stuck with COVID or, or on COVID lockdown. So 
Uh, it's like everybody came back outside, and they they don't want to keep animals at the moment, or not at the same rate they were buying them. So, uh, you know, there's some adjustment, especially with a lot of animals in a big collection that you got to kind of... I mean, if you've been doing it 22 years, you might have had some experience already with going through, like, the, the different uh, years and the economy and the effects and everything. But for me, this I think this is my first little dip like that that I've had to deal with animals. And it's like, whoa, I need to think about this and how I structure things in the future, you know? So it's uh, definitely... Yeah, it's, it's definitely there. Um, I suck at selling animals to begin <laughs> with, even in a good market. Um, I'll, like, I'll post something, and I'll get inquiries, and then I'll decide to keep it. Yep, like, <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So, so for me, when, when the market's down, I just, I just stay quiet and keep my stuff, and I, I don't count on the money from it. The money would be nice. I think everyone's goal is at least to have their stuff pay for the hobby itself. Dude, right. you should make a list. That's always just been unrealistic for you me. You should make right. a list and give them to give me pictures with the list. I can sell everything for you, <laughs> and I won't take a, I won't take a penny, man. You know, people hit me up for everything every day, and I think people see it like you know, I, I kind of take people's pictures. They'll ask me to just drop it on my page, and then you can stop me from trying to keep and it. And it's yes. uh, it's sold in an hour, you know, because and it's I don't know, it's just so many people that are always hitting me up for stuff. And I I know you got a lot of great looking things, man. But when you when you ever want to get rid of a bunch of stuff, man, because I know you got so many things and some projects you really want to get done. Uh, that's why I felt like when I was. Uh, having the Kimberly's and then I was doing other random projects that I was trying to raise like some tree monitors and things like that. Um, on top of the Kai Island stuff that I really, you know, really, really wanted to get done. Um, I felt like the Kimberly's were taking so much of my available, not even time available stress. You Like I, I have so much that I can really <laughs> every day, you know? And so there's so many hours of the day and so much, pressure that is you know to just breed monitors or to get these done in a in a timely manner or try to you know figure them out figure them out sooner you know and um these kylans have been sure i hatched one this earlier this year but that one ended up dying a couple months later but it's like you know i'm waiting for that 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 next inch for me um and i've had to kind of step back from everything that was really t you know I, yeah you guys have known i've been basically in a little clam lately, you know, I don't really want to <laughs> share or, or talk a whole lot just because I got a whole lot going on with everything yeah. and personal life and making sure that I got to stay on top of the 10 monitors that I got, you know, and, uh, you sure. I mean, one is a whole, one is enough work, but picture uh, into your dozens and two dozens of monitors. It's a, you know, it's a lot of brain work and I had to take a step back. You know, I had to step back from, from all of the other extra projects and and I wanted I had I have cages outside that are technically ready for some outdoor species that I was looking to want to work with too you know because I like collared lizards I like chuck wallas and things like yeah. that too but it's like yeah I just just couldn't do it man and yeah I, I'm encouraging you Chris so because you got some top notch projects that you can really uh, you know that you can really focus on. I'm jealous of this outdoor potential. It's already in the 30s here at oh, night. Man. Chris, where are you at? In Indianapolis. Oh, wow. Already in the 30s? Man. Man. The yeah. temperatures are already in the 30s that, over there where they're at. That, that'll limit you real quick. Yeah, I think uh, Mon Monday's high is going to be 45. So, oh, boy. With the, all right, with everything that you got going on is, is uh, all the rooms that you're in, with the with the monitors or animals that need the excessive heat, are you balancing with the heat lamps that are on and keep that, and that takes care of most of the ambient room, or do you got to use like big space heaters for that whole like the building you're in now? You got to use a bunch of space heaters and things like that. So it, it depends where I'm working. One of one of the cons right now is that a, a lot of my collections is in a basement 
And I, I like basement keeping. When I when I kept in the basement before at, at places that I rented or owned, um, it was nice because I, I would like sub off a room and you could just control that room's ambient. Um, but right now I'm across an entire basement, so the ambient is really cold, and I'm relying on supplemental heat for everything, which is frustrating when you're dealing with snakes and we're using a bunch of heat tape and thermostats and this and that. Uh, I hate space heaters. I'm just paranoid. I feel like I'm going to burn the place down. I know sometimes they're a necessary evil when I have used them. I've used like a backup thermostat on them. Um, I, I have a lot of electrical knowledge, so I run all of my, all of my own circuits and stuff. So if I run a space heater, I, I dedicated some line to it. Um, but the one thing about that cold ambient is I think that's what prompted helps prompt the cycling in the crops. Yeah. Um, because it just naturally got a lot cooler than if I had kept them. Like, when I raised when I raised that female, she was raised in a room that was like an 80 ambient. Yeah. And she could get into the 70s to go down at night and stuff, but I don't think it's been anything like this. And this, this along with uh, the calorie deficit, I, I think really helped. Right, and so... It just makes everything So when, when I told you to go really low, how low did you end up going? 55? 40? So I don't think that the space got much cooler than like 65, okay. but I had set her up uh, near like, um, like the egress window in the basement. Yeah. And I've actually cracked it open, so I think it got like that bottom corner of the cage yeah. uh, into the fifties, and she gravitated. Right, there. that's like she had a way to escape it, and she chose to go there because I feel like she felt like she needed those cool temperatures to do whatever she was trying to do, like build the follicles or whatever. Yeah, yes, that's amazing, man. And uh, I don't, you know, I didn't really. I was kind of expecting you to say that, but it's because mine do the same thing. They. They want that 60, 50 degrees that they can get to. And it's not the whole entire cage. It's just somewhere that they can get to in the cage, like, you yeah. know, a, a, a wall or a, a corner or a really small section. Um, and that, what's weird is that I was talking with uh, with Asher Green yesterday, right, As because he got some NOM monitors, and I was kind of explaining to him, like, what, what I've expected. Tell them to give me that blue. That one. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about those blue Niles, and we're talking about how, you know. I saw one of them in person. Yeah, they're, man, they're, 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 pretty nice. they're amazingly great looking. Um, and I was telling myself, too, like, hey, I, I wish, you know, I think on an episode or two, Alan, um, we, we mentioned about yeah. Nile monitors, about how someone should really oh, take yeah. the jump on the sacrifice to do Nile monitors, you know. And um, and then bam, like Asher shows these two really nice blue ones. I don't know if you've seen them on Facebook, but they are very very blue Niles. Um, it's the, where where the green is. Yeah, I, I saw the one. In, in, yeah, very powder blue when he got them. And um, it's a, uh, you know, just talking about how you're going to the colder temperatures. Um, I was just really recommending Asher to. Because in his place, he's he, as we're discussing that part, right, about how you got to kind of let them, when it's that cool period, 65 and 50 are no issue, you know. Um, they can probably handle cooler where they're, where they're possibly from or what they're maybe exposed to, but those are uh, comfortable lows for me, you know. And, uh, and so as far as them being really um, – really getting the ability to get down there. You know, Asher had this issue where he kept his house so warm during the wintertime. It's not anybody's fault. It's what you're comfortable with, right? And so people use heaters and, you know, their house doesn't really go below 70-something. You know what I mean? It's it's quite warm, especially when you live in the Northeast where obviously it's going to get really cold in wintertime. So, it's not like where you're in California where it's still 60 degrees, you know, and it's winter time. So um, we're, we're, we we can kind of get to luck out where we don't really have to use too much more than a little space here at nighttime. Um, but, you know, where it snows, sure, that'll help him. But where he was keeping them, the house gets really hot, 
you know, and uh, the bottom of the cage gets really hot where that ambient is like a oh, hundred degrees. I'm sorry. That ambient is like 80 degrees, but you know, and it makes the whole cage extra hot and it, it kind of really, it, uh, it deters your whole enclosure to get to the low point that you want. Um, and uh, yeah, man, I'm actually glad that you brought that up just because I, I you know, I don't always think like, Oh man, what it did is what I, what is what I said, like something that he tried, you know, or is this like something that we're going to try to implement for sure? Just to see if this makes a difference than from how we were doing it back then. Right. <clears throat> um, most. Yeah, and, and the one thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is like, so these are equal, like they're, they're found along the equators and they go with the assumption that it's a pretty stable temperature year round. Right. If you go and pull the weather data from places in Indonesia, you're going to see that the temperatures are pretty stable year yeah. round. Um, then, but I think that's, that that's a there's way. a lot to be found in these micro right. habitats that you're not going to find on available data other than field research, whether they're up high in a tree in the shade, down in a burrow, and whatever the substrate is. Like, I really, really think these animals are getting colder than any data that you would regularly see. Right. Um, otherwise they'd be intolerant. And even my scrub pythons, like I, I would get them into the fifties and it would prompt locks almost immediately. Wow. And females would hug their water bowls trying to get cooler when they're building follicles. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot that we just don't know about that space, but we can try to plug in those pieces yeah. from how we see them respond to tests in captivity. No, that's a, that's a great, great, uh, I guess factors that you pointed out with even the scrub pythons, um, man, that's, uh, for me, uh, I've kind of been paying attention to the same thing. Just, uh, those Googled temperatures or, you know, we will try to look up data that's over there. A lot of times that, that stuff is just a uh, regular air temperature, you know, like you don't get to, um, like the hillside where, yeah, and like in the center of the city. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, right. And then those are that; those are those temperatures in the shade in the city somewhere, but not off of a cliff that gets you know really cold winds at nighttime, or you know, let's say in a really deep dark cave where it's not really going to have uh, the sun kick gear its heat, and it basically is a lot cooler um, surface temperature wise and that ambient temperature wise as well. You know, it's, there's a there, you know, obviously there's a difference between the two, but that that colder surface temperature, that's what we're mostly talking about, is where that animal can lay there. And that's the temperature it's you know it's chasing. It, 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 you know, why why else is it going there when they normally you would assume assume them not to go there, you know, just because hey, it's really cold, but I, I see see them utilizing it and you know, doing things like that where all right, it seems like this is a a positive addition to the enclosure, you know, or a positive thing where it, it's making a difference in my clutches, my success rates, my, you know, locks or how often you get them to breed and complete the whole process. You know, uh, I, I never, I, I was actually really surprised when those crocs gave you those nice pearly white eggs like that. Like you would think of how, how much we were waiting and we were waiting for weeks for her to lay right. Almost to the point where we gave up, you know, um, yeah, man. Yeah, and then when I saw that one picked out of the nest, I thought it was going to be like her previous infertiles where she just scattered them. So that's the first thing I started looking for. I started looking for other scattered eggs. I didn't even run to the nest. <laughs> so what did I miss, guys? Um, just the uh, oh, we we're talking about cooler temperatures with uh, right. uh, basically what we've been trying to implement, see if it works. Right. right, and I've done it with my Indicus, and I've shared it with other people, you know. And Chris Foley has taken taken the the option as well to have his Crocs into the sixties, right, fifties and sixties, and yeah, we even we've gone to the high fifties in some places. Yeah, so you know, it's um, it's a thing that works. I don't know. The, the animals chase it. I can't. I don't have much science to just prove behind it, but you know, Chris was giving some backup about how his scrub pythons would um, wrap themselves around like uh, colder See, water I miss, dishes. I to miss this. Them. Yeah. So um, I want to hear that stuff. 
Yeah, man. It's uh, trying to just like we learn from each other, right? We learn from right. other other aspects of of the hobby that's you know not exactly like this one, but hey, you can take some ideas that are possibly relatable in certain certain instances and try them out, right? right. Uh, that's that's all we're really doing. It's, it's, these things have there's nothing new. It's right. just more newly practiced on these other things where, like a lot of us back then would assume that just because they live on the equator or, you know, when you Google these temperatures or look up Google map temperatures, they're not really like in, you know, if they're like take temperatures taken in the city in the shade or right. partially in the sun, you know, they're not really uh, like I, I kind of mentioned, like in a cave or somewhere in a very deep burrow that doesn't get sun or. Um, off of like a, a cliff in the middle of the night when it's really cold, you know. Um, so just ideas like that. A lot of them they connect to like towers they erect, and usually these towers are up on a hill somewhere, uh, somewhere where there's not a lot of interference. So that's the the temperatures you're getting. Sometimes in a city, it's like on top of a building somewhere. So um, if if it's similar to how I've seen them in other other countries and here. That's a lot of times where you see those weather towers or the ones that are actually recording a temperature. So it's not exactly under under the canopy, you know, barely sticking out. That's where they can bask on a, a rock or a log or somewhere. So you're right. It can be a little skewed sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're just, just trying it out, man. Um, yeah. And, uh, I don't know. Hey, how often do you look at that incubator every day? <laughs> Man, I'm sitting right next to him now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting next to mine too. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, I think I think we all we all have had them or use them, but like windows on incubators are such a such a human thing because we have to see what's in. But it's also yeah. like the weakest point of you know the incubator itself, as far as it's where you're going to have the most. Uh, Usually, loss of heat retention and where where you're going to have a temperature difference is next to that that glass. But at the same yeah. time, we like the convenience of just looking in, <laughs> just to be able to look at them. Like we can really do anything that that instant in the process anyway. <laughs> hey, so what? I forgot which I forgot which method you tried to go with, uh, Chris. Did you go with just in a sim or in vermiculite or what did you end up using? So it's basically a, a sim style. So I have sim containers, but somebody else who works here stole them from me for his shrub python eggs. <laughs> so I made something similar. I have a I have these like those Cambro food service containers, yeah. and I made a custom gasket for them, and it makes it super super airtight, kind of like the sim. And then I just did like. Um, uh, like suspended plastic so that they could sit over the um, the substrate and I have the like perlite under it. Um, I like this sim better because that grate yeah. is so much better for stopping the eggs from rolling. Yeah. Like I have these ugly pieces of foam in there right now like yeah. in between the eggs so I'm terrified I'm going to pull the box out and roll one. Uh, I always <laughs> thought that foam retains moisture so much. And that it's uh, it's technically touching the eggs and then transferring moisture back and forth to the egg. Not that that's a great idea or that's a bad idea. I just I think that's what it. Why I I, I at one point I was like making that using whatever to kind of make sim stuff, right? Um, and then uh, I would use you know the that. That white grate that you put in front of the lights, I forget what they're called. You know, I would smash those. Light diffuser. Yeah, the light diffuser, and I, I'd smash those, or I'd have little rails and, you know, try to put the eggs there. Uh, but yeah, nothing beats that, that grid. And uh, I tried to yeah. use so many things. I don't know if he's, if he's always had them or not, but did you notice some? Um... In the Sims now, he has those little dividers that kind of click into the grate. Yes, yeah, I those think are they're a newer, new. newer thing. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I just use like a, they're awesome. Yeah, that that's cool. I like. I those. just use like a straw or I, anything plastic cut up that I can put in that hole, right? 
and then uh, into the grain, and then I just you know it just stops the egg. So I'm I used to use a lot of um, push pins, you know the 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 tacks, um, the ones with the plastic piece of course, and they just you know poked in there, sat in there. They're just they they hold the eggs quite well. Um, yeah, man, I was I was thinking about what I was doing with foam. Have you hatched anything in substrate? Yeah, yeah, I've hatched the. Uh, I've hatched Kimberly's. I mean, like as far as all the reptiles, you mean, or just monitor wise? No, just monitors, but like actually, like semi buried instead of suspended. Um, I've only done the Kimberly's in um, perlite, vermiculite, and I've done them over the turfus rocks, those little pebbles, um, mm-hmm. and I've yes. Uh, with the uh, help of other additional like tricks that I did at the end of incubation, those seem to work pretty well. Um, but I've always done the indicus in a sim. Just I've kind of hatched them very at, at the very beginning that way, um, and I've also just con- just continued the same method, you know, um, with pretty good success rate. I mean. I'm not sure if it's my incubator or it's the times that I've changed them or or the fact that my refrigerator style homemade homemade one held much better temperature than the one that I have now that's made out of PVC. Um, and so, you know, I, I like the style. So it's funny because I'm a cake builder by trade and also build incubators, but I'm going to discredit myself and say that I wholly agree with the fridge concept yeah. as the best option. It's just thicker foam. It's insulated. I have a big double door commercial freezer that I converted, and that thing doesn't budge a tenth yeah. of a degree. I mean, I couldn't do that out of PVC for yeah. all the money in yeah. the world. So I, I've been in the market days. or looking on, like, for broken perfectly sized um, old refrigerator, old mini refrigerators. Um, and I, I found a couple, but these people were out of the way and I haven't really gone to travel that far just for an old refrigerator. But yeah, man, I've, I I had to get rid of my old one because the front ended up cracking on the way, on the move from Northern California to SoCal. Um, at the very last, as I was tilting it on its side, it just the front popped and it you know the glass pieces the glass pieces stayed together and i just taped it for months it was working until i realized all right i I don't think it's this is i don't like this look anymore you know what i mean (laughs) um yeah yeah so i bought a a sea serpents one and i've had some fluctuations in this one much more than um than my old refrigerator and what's weird is i've hatched i've hatched monitors out of this one I've hatched Kimberly's out in this new one. I've hatched mangroves out in this new one, a few clutches. So it's not that it's horrible. It's just, you know, I kind of want to go back to the non fluctuations and it holds better. Yeah. I don't care if it's an old refrigerator or something like that. I just want the effects, you know, and this, I was kind of going for looks and hoping the effects would just back it up. But it, 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 if I showed you my incubator right now, it basically has foam around the front. The sides, the top, the other side, you know, anything that's that can catch draft and just to keep it from insulating better. So it's got this. So that's the thing about that is we could design something like that to make a PVC incubator. This has effect on different really ones, big, really but then you end up having to sandwich some foam in there and it starts yeah, to price yeah. you out. Because that PVC is so yeah. damn expensive. Yeah. Other materials would make more sense. Even like I buy five pallets at a time. Yeah. Other, other materials would definitely make more sense, especially just just doing your your uh, FRP or tile like the uh, the PVC sheets you can buy and glue uh, silicone. The the if if we're talking about strictly for incubation purposes, you know, then you don't have to worry about converting a a fridge or that motor unit that's usually under there that you're not going to need things like that um you know you can do it in a better way in fact i have one the the two that i have they are basically that they're frp with like i want to say an inch thick foam and then whatever wood was used to uh make it i don't know if it was um 
I want to say it was probably like birch or something similar to that. Um, so and it's it's pretty effective at what it does, you know. But for the most part, you think about the weight of that thing, pricing people out, and whatnot. Uh, I think the PVC things are great for snakes that are probably going to hatch within 60 days anyway. And, you know, you're going to not see too much fluctuation, too many problems with that. But when you're talking about sometimes up to a year for a, for a monitor or at the very least, you know, a hundred days, um, there's a lot of different factors that come into play then. So, um, but yeah, incubator design, (laughs) I'm sure we've all thought about it. We, We could probably, put one together you know, on all these ideas right here but uh <laughs> rob rob uh, rob rob fost um uh-huh. you know uh le- legendary rob fost he showed me his uh, incubator that he has now and it's a it's a wooden one i don't know what it looks on the inside i didn't really pry too much but it's the perfect size because it's built to the t right and it just looks like right like what I have, but made out of wood. And I don't know how he did the inside, but, you know, I would assume he took took it to the point where it was water resistant. And um, I would say because the the it was so thick, the walls were at least an inch thick, I, I, I'd assume anyways, because of how it looked built. Um, and you can see the edges and stuff like that. I would say that holds yeah. a lot better than the the, the P. So they make um, they make a thin grade PVC that's a little bit cheaper. So what I, I had thought about doing like an exterior uh, like custom woodwork that kind of is furniture grade, lining the inside with foam, and then doing the thinner PVC to sandwich the foam so that it's PVC and cleanable and waterproof inside but still really well insulated yeah um and then for the door it's kind of like what what he said about the glass being a sensitive part like i almost i almost want to make it so that like the glass is recessed yeah and then there's a hinged pvc cover that Absolutely. you can open to look into the glass yes. or foam or something like Technically that what i have now but up on there. <laughs> right right but we've yeah, all done yeah. that. that similar... You can also do like, like all these PVC guys all just do the single pane glass. Yes. Like you can go to a glass shop and get the insulated double pane glass that's on freezers and fridges. Right. Again, it becomes expensive again. So it's like everybody should just go out and buy a fridge and stop having this stupid conversation. But right. <laughs> for people that that don't want to do the do it yourself project, I think that we can do a lot better. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely do, too. I think um, if you really wanted to do it, I mean, talking about, like, for larger larger setups, um, something that could do not only that, but uh, if you could actually have a way to set the ambient humidity in there, so by use of, um, I don't know, some type of fogger with fans also that could suck air in, uh, push air out, um, so you could mess with that and see where you like it uh in conjunction with whatever type of medium substrate you're using for the uh for the eggs um you know you you would have to dial it into your setup but i think that could be really effective on some of these issues some of us run into especially this stupid battle with these kim eggs that seem to play everybody from time to time um they just yeah you know everybody Uh, even the best of keepers sometimes you know don't yeah it's just yeah, they're they're tricky. So I don't I don't know how I would make this more user friendly to to market it, but the big double door commercial freezer that I use has like it's got like eight different zones. Yeah. Like <laughs> I do I do all heat cable. I don't do any heat tape because it allows for more uh, wattage per square inch. Um and then all of my fans are independently tied to their own thermostats too to trigger on and off so it's a it's a six foot high freezer that doesn't have a tenth of a degree variance from sealing the floor nice nice very nice and when you when you say heat cable you're talking like the uh industrial stuff not the not the zoom ed 50 you know foot cord right 
right. You probably could do it with that on something smaller, right. but on this one, it's like HVAC or yeah. like heated floor type cable. Yeah. yeah, that's what's in the bottom of, of mine. Uh, my problem is the fans in the summertime create enough heat that when they're on and the ambient just within the room is 85 degrees, it kicks the uh, the temperature up in the incubator itself. So I, I have to disconnect the fans in a certain way, and it gets a little hairy sometimes. So <laughs> I'm still figuring out some solutions in mine. And then um, we talked our last episode that actually hasn't put, been put out yet, um, but I was talking to Kai that... Uh, Frank, uh, Redis, Dallas Zoo, and then the um, the Barkers have all used a room of some sort to incubate animals in, and we kind of got into talking about the um, the idea of you know setting up a room if possible, and some of the things that we're like uh, we're taking into consideration is okay, we're trying to narrow down all the all the uh, different aspects to make it within a tenth of a degree like like I want to do, but in a, uh, in the wild, of course, they're experiencing these temperature fluctuations and, uh, humidity fluctuations. And I think there's a perfect recipe where they're just happy for the most part. But, um, is it possible at different times, these eggs, you know, we're, we're trying to hold on to a, a certain temperature and humidity throughout the whole lifespan of when that animal's in that egg. But, are there times when during development when that animal's maybe needing to shed more moisture through that egg? Are we allowing for that? How are we allowing for that? Where are we allowing like that moisture to go, uh, or be drier or receive more moisture, especially in these guys that take, you know, a year to, uh, to hatch sometimes. I haven't seen too much, too many problems with the, the, yeah. Cause if they're just buried underground, they're facing potentially all of the seasons. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, especially you take something like a lace monitor or Spencer's, you know, it's like they're they're going through some changes down there. <laughs> and even if they don't have major temperature changes, there's still at least a dry and wet season where they're from. Like, right. Right. So the idea with this room... That's, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, the idea with this room was that you just had more airspace overall. And you could use slightly bigger containers, even if it was a, a, just a clutch of Ackies or Kimberleys. And you could use um, more airspace between the eggs and the top of the containers, and then the, the ambient of that room altogether, and then more, um, more medium uh, underneath, where there is a moisture content to it, but it's not drying out as fast. Um, and it's, it's something I, I kind of want to mess with and try out, just for this whole incubation conversation, because I think... I think we can go two different ways to it. We can figure something out to a T and figure out what they need and then size down or with some of these species that we're, we're trying to hatch and get into because not a lot of people have done it or no one's done it yet, um, give them more free range and then within that we can then start to narrow it down. Almost like, almost like people have figured out with, you would say, ball pythons, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatnot. They had, everybody was figuring out how to keep these things. Now it's cut down to a science, uh, for the most part. I, yeah. I say that with never bra- never being uh, able to breed ball python, never really keeping them or trying. But uh, <laughs> so I don't want to get ahead of myself. But with that idea out there, um, you know, just I, I would like to know both. I would like to know, okay, this species, this is how I can run them, and this is what I need, and then what will work where I can have several different species inside this incubator and not have a worry because essentially all their needs are met or they can, there's enough there where um, like a a Kimberly rock monitor can hatch next to a sand monitor can hatch next to a, not in the same container for the listeners. I'm not saying next to uh, (laughs) tub adjacent, you know? Uh, No, but I I see what you mean. Cause like I I talk about this big freezer incubator that I love Mm -hmm. Well, my croc eggs aren't even in there because at the time we had a whole bunch of scrub pythons and they're incubating at 87 degrees. So now I have the croc eggs over in this little PVC that incidentally is, is incubating with some tree monitor eggs and they can handle similar conditions, but it would be cool to have a big space that you can kind of manipulate separate things within that space, Yeah. especially with how much stuff I keep. Yeah. Yeah. If I ever actually had a good year, which I never do because <laughs> I always do something stupid, 
I, w- I would need like 10 different incubators from all this stuff from around the world. Right. Like, <laughs> right. You know, I, yeah, I have to set up, uh, I have to set up gecko eggs at my house cause I can't keep them anywhere near the warehouse. They'll just evaporate and, you know, <laughs> um, and then with, uh, can we just go back to like native blue bridge that you can incubate on a right. shelf <laughs> on top right. of the fridge? Uh, when I was a kid, when I when uh, this pet store that I was uh, volunteering at, they had these gopher snakes that a customer brought in in a Tupperware. They just put it on the fridge, and then a couple months later, there was babies. Yeah, I thought that was I thought that was pretty cool, though. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but an interesting thing that you that you mentioned this variant was, um, I have a friend, and you'll probably know who it is. I just don't know if you want to be mentioned, but he works with Black Roughnecks. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've been obviously pretty hard to produce. And one thing that he accidentally did was a female laid some eggs. I don't know if some of them were duds, if he didn't find them all or whatever. But an egg stayed buried and hatched in the enclosure. And we think mom ate the baby. Oh, boy. Because it was an egg that something clearly exited. The egg did not get eaten, and there was no baby to be found. Yeah. Um, could there be some other theories? Maybe, but if it did go that way, it's interesting to see that something had to have changed over those several months in the cage that wasn't as stable as an incubator, and it was still successful, incidentally. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes good eggs are good eggs, you know. Especially if you didn't know an egg. He could have turned off heat to that egg box. Who knows what he did, and it was it was still okay. Yeah, I found uh, I I haven't mentioned this yet, but I found two old Kimberly eggs that almost looked like they were inside of each other. But you know when a monitor eats an egg, how they they poop it out and it has a certain look and consistency to it. These still had like the full egg, and when I, yeah. when I picked them up, they were um, they were kind of that hard like you would see a, just a dry egg hard and so I spent forever looking in that cage but I didn't find any so I don't know for sure if they hatched out of there but uh, I, I wonder if it did and they ate them but I'll never know but I know it's possible I think um, who was it just recently had a monitor hatch out oh uh, uh gosh um, uh, I know his name he's over in the east coast uh, boogie down that hatched Boogie down. Had the okay, yeah, yeah. Had the had the Tristis hatch. I know them. I don't know them. I knew they produced some Tristis. Is that what yeah, you did? The, yeah. And, and some baby it's, Tristis hatched yeah. out. Yeah, his and uh, it was uh, basking, or the adults were basking on a log, and it was in the background on a little cork flat. <laughs> um, but I think that's uh, I think that's boogie down reptiles or yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to say I and Ian. That's cool. It's it's a long roundabout story, but I actually have one of the oh, yeah? here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a cool little thing. I like Tristis, man. I, I but I think for most people they are like the uh, they're like if you're into IPAs, which I'm not, but I know plenty of people that are into IPAs, they're kinda like that that designer IPA of the monitor world. Like they, they might not necessarily be for you. They're a little quirky in what they do. They're not really like an Aki. They're, they're, they're absolutely their own thing, you know, and um, their personality, sometimes yeah. they're going to stay flighty their entire lives. Sometimes they'll calm down as, as adults. And, um, you know, and the way mine treat my, me, it's just like, well, we're, we're taking last year off. I've done everything else the same. And they're like, yeah, but we just don't want to this year. I don't know, you little punks. <laughs> But they are. I'll tell you what, I, I love these Kims. The one that, that Kai sent me was the, the first ones that I've yeah. ever gotten my hands on. And they're more flighty than, than like an Aki, but when they have their distance from you, they're just so yeah. stinking inquisitive. Yeah, they're yeah. like little squirrels. So cool. that's, yeah. That's how, that's how, yeah. Park squirrels, the ones yeah. that will eventually come up to you. <laughs> yeah. They're, uh, yeah, man, those, those are the last, I think the last, no, I, I think I hatched out another couple, but those are basically the last, that I, that I was kind of going to raise to basically do Kim's again, right? And, um, yeah, man, I'm kind of glad I sold them to you, because then I'd have, right now, I'd have to put them in a, 
five foot enclosure and I already got rid of that space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I just had somebody hit me up. He says, Hey, are you looking for a Dorianus? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Always. You know, uh, it's funny. I I was telling Kai, I separate so I have my Dorianus. I had these two together since they were um, babies basically when they came in and one looked obviously male one looked obviously female and I separated them because the the obvious female wasn't eating as much and they were starting to get bigger and a little older and you could tell that one was definitely staying hidden most of the time so I took that one out and it turned into a male within three weeks or so <laughs> it was like, I just totally oh, wow. blew my mind the way it, the head filled out the way the tail base filled out and just its structure overall. And I'm just like... So now you're looking at two males? Yeah, out of those two. So I'm looking at all males, unfortunately. Oh, um, man. Yeah, it's tough. Like, uh, How many do you have? Cor- Corey got just... one, too. Sold to him as a female. And yeah. uh, the once they got to him, he just looked at the nuts and he showed me. I was like, yeah, those are indicus. They're not huge packages, but you can tell, though. A male is... Yeah easy to tell you that. I'm, I'm down to just these three, and unfortunately this has been one of those projects where uh, if, it, if it can go wrong, it has gone wrong. So uh, uh, whether they're, they've died um, in my care, uh, shown up dead, or... Ran um, away? Yeah. One man... I don't even want to talk about it yet. It's still, it's still t- too much. It's embarrassing. Yeah, it is. If you ever had something get loose, don't go talk to Kai about it. Because <laughs> I had a, a melanist get out, and the first thing, he wastes no seconds. I'm like, I can't believe I did this, dude. I, somehow I lost, and I left the door open. Like, it was just yeah. me. Like, I was just an idiot. I was feeding two pages, going back and forth. You take this while you're eating. I'll feed this one. And I just then I just left. Yeah. Um, and the female stayed in the cage, and he went out. And I'm like, Kai, I can't believe I'm such an idiot because we suspected that the female was starting the cycle, and that's when I lost the male. Um, first thing Kai says, doesn't waste a second. He's outside. <laughs> He's gone. I'm like... <laughs> Son of a bitch! I'm not talking to you anymore. Yeah, I watched. I watched mine run out. So here, basically, I always have. I have two rooms in the warehouse, right? They're identical sized rooms, but the overall space is about thirty by thirty. And so, one section, and they share an interior door. So I will always keep the the roll up door. I will always keep shut where all the animals are, and I'll come in through the other roll up door, and then through the interior door just as a little safety protocol so that if anything got out it could only run into the next space um i show up one day and there is this transient guy acting crazy that kind of been in the neighborhood i've seen a couple times and i had just seen him out kind of in front of the where the warehouses are um so i i take my kids with me a lot to go ride their bikes out in the parking lot or play while i'm working with the animals and since he was there or nearby um i rolled up the door with the animals now prior to this this little dorianus would stay hidden or would see me coming you know go hide in something and then stay hidden while i did whatever maintenance i needed to do in there so I have this door open now. I just go in to grab the water bowl just to change it. So I got a water bowl and a jug in my hand, and the door's open only enough. I thought, oh, I'll close it like halfway for the water bowl. It's not going anywhere. This thing stays hidden. Sure enough, just pew, right past me. It's like the cage is closest to the, the, the exit now, and it's just gone. I see it go across the parking lot into a field, and then it's just like I can only do so much. You know, it's, uh, yeah, that one killed me. Oh, my God. It absolutely killed me. I, the, Dude. the night's okay, what, pretty cold, so. What, what makes it worse, right? This no, Dorianus. Don't, say it, Kai. Don't, was, don't say it, Kai. This is no? exactly what Chris just said. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is the most okay. gorgeous Dorianus in the world. Uh, like, gorgeous. Like, the best uh, looking, no color. It was basically exanthic looking. 
It right? was. It was. Yeah. That's the one. It wasn't that pastel from the show that I wanted to buy, it was, was it? Um, it was. It was absolutely was. that. Yeah. No, this was a. Uh, it was basically like ghost colored. Uh, yeah, and, that's what I tokened is as as the ghost Dorianus because it basically had no color other than black and white. It would have been like this steely gray, ivory blue, you know, color. I just. There, it's out. It's out. Did you get that at one of the one of the big shows? Yeah, out like there? at Anaheim or something like at that. Anaheim. Yeah. Yeah, because you had a picture of it. John at Dragna sent me a picture yeah. of it, and I'm like, I want that thing. And they're like, Alan bought it, and I'm like, that's when I figured out I was done with you before we met. <laughs> Yeah, well, man, now, I, I actually, now you know you really are. <laughs> I got uh, to hold that thing. <laughs> it was awesome. It was absolute. It was a great feeder. Um, I had no problems with that animal adjusting, and um, it was putting on some great size and weight real quick. And that. So now, you know, my poor kids, they don't get to play. If I think something's if I, going on, I actually installed a camera outside so I could see them, but. Um, Man, Man if I me. if I uh, had the space, I come across Dorianus all the time, and it's you know they're so gorgeous, but I just don't got the eight foot, you know, and the way I want to do it, it's it's longer than eight foot because you're accommodating two four foot lizards, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I, I I'd like to come across workable adults, like not even not even tolerant of me but like really workable adults. Some that you can go in there and grab. I've run across tame tame ones, but you know, the other the other opposite sex was not so good. And so right. um, yeah, I'm waiting to the point where I get two really workable animals. And I think that's a big factor in the in the indica stuff is because they're so, you know, shy, reclusive and they basically dart away for the most part. Man, getting them to actually do stuff and you're, you know, then you have to intervene with some stuff or or even like do something random like lift the latch, right? Man, these things run frantically and don't won't breed in front. I mean, if they're not going to eat in front of you, what makes you think they're going to want to have sex in front of you? You know what I mean? Right. Like, right? And so... Um, I've noticed yeah, mine I, like water. They like... Yeah, right. They, too, so. they love to sit and do it in the water and... Uh, <laughs> When I'm when I'm breeding them, I have so, to introduce the water back in. Have your Dorianus? Uh, have they tolerated each other well? They they actually. So I've only had the two together out of the the different ones I've had. I've only had these two together, and it became obvious that one was super dominant in that real that like uh, teenage growth phase that we're going into now into like real sub adult. Um, so that's why I actually separated the two. And then the other one popped out like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a boy too type of deal. So, um, they, they never attacked each so other. So they had a pair here, but they were like food dominant probably. Yeah. More like one, one had boxed the other one out from all the resources except for, you know, minor stuff. So, uh, but no, no physical altercations like that. So there's a, a pair here that Desiree and Steven owned at Cold Blooded Cafe, and they we're going to get rid of them. They're not the prettiest of the of the blue tails, um, but the one thing that that I noticed was they've been cohab for years, nice. and they share everything. They'll share the basking area. You can feed one right in front of the other without them ripping their faces off. Man, um, it's a very obvious pair. So I'm like, I'm like, I don't care how ugly those things are. You're you're not selling them, or you gotta or you gotta let me buy. They're one point one pair. Just because the hard stories that I've heard of them tolerating each other, I'm like, we have to at least try yeah. Yeah. with these. So right now. Um, I guess technically we fifty fifty own them, and they're still on cold blooded cafe property. They're a, um, they've got a pretty good cage, but it's it's much, which isn't bad for their space because they have a whole room that's that's really well ambient, so the animals do well in the mesh, and they love climbing it and stuff. But my my next step when I get time is I just want to get them out of there so that I can manipulate their conditions different from everything else in the room and and see what we can do. Yeah. 
has she ever dropped eggs? She digs a lot. So I don't know if she has and he's gone after him and ate him or she has and, and they just didn't go looking at the time because it wasn't necessarily their interest to breed them. Yeah. Um, but I, I think at least with that that digging habit, uh, hopefully there's there's some nest testing there rather than just messing around because it's only her who does it. Um, but I, I think that we probably would need to tweak the nesting area a little bit. There's a lot of options because it's it's very deep substrate, so they're given the whole cage to choose from. Oh. Um, but I think we would need to come up with like some of the the side heating yeah. uh, that we've built together, or a specific nest box to dial in the conditions better. Because I think that even if she's wanted to lay, maybe she couldn't quite find the spot that was desirable to. Yeah. And you gotta admit, if they're not being uh, done, I have that so much attention to them other than maintenance. I just am so excited that they that they get along that I try to I try to like rotate my focuses yeah. because there's so much. If I try to do it all at once, I'm gonna screw it up. Yeah. Um. So I'll like if if Crocs are my thing, that is where all of my efforts going, and everything else is still getting maintained. Right. Um. But I'm definitely probably missing cues and other things i'm just making sure that they're well fed and healthy yeah um and then i'll and then i'll shift the gears yeah so maybe that'll when we figure out what the colonists are doing um you know maybe after that I'll, I'll focus on them and maybe try to rotate them with this winter season I've, um and then the the salvador i would lock up again this morning nice yeah, I, was, I was gonna ask that you should about be that. where it's, that is that focus is <laughs> it's been what almost almost three months since they've she's laid you said two and a half months yeah so I, I put them back together about a month after she laid and wasn't much interest but wasn't much interest she wasn't eating ferociously like she normally does she's a pretty reclusive lizard yeah um so one of the things that i can tell when she's starting the cycle is she will tongue feed normally i have to drop feed with her or put it in her court that she likes because she doesn't like to approach me okay um, but when she starts like getting getting thick and starting to go through that process, she'll like jump out of the cage and, and try to eat. Yeah, that's that's what's a great uh, a great indicator uh, for me too. Like they'll the normal shy stuff, um, they'll hit tongs, you know, they'll go charge for food. But on a normal basis, they'd rather just have you leave food and they'll you know, they'll get to it when you when you're like not right. paying attention, right? Yeah. I have um, the the one that I knew was a male, and and the other one. Well, actually, um, the one that's been separate this whole time. Um, they'll actually tong feed for me, which is pretty cool. They um, so in their cages, I just basically I had some wood pallets that I meant to break down and use for other stuff, and I figured out the wood pallet will just sit in the the cage itself if I just throw it in there. So I stack both of those up against each other on one wall and he likes to hide right at the top where you can dip his head in and out so it started with just that just hanging some food over from tongs and he'd come out now he'll come out all the way and uh tong feed for me that's cool yeah. and i have about 150 wood pallets outside right they, now they make great vertical hides you can just you know angle them up against the wall and i was like oh i don't have to do any more work with this because they crawl right up them they can disappear and uh then I pile up the dirt a little bit at the backside, so if they want to dig down in there or do whatever they want, and just make sure they're secure in there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's the the sand monitors could care less about them. I have them in some other cages, and they care less about them. But the Dorianus, they're so like they they want to be up high, and then they want to be in the water bowl, and then sometimes I find them dug under, like burrowed under something, and they they kind of amaze me at at just where they'll be at any given time, um, where other animals will definitely prefer different things. I I can't put one thing where it's like, oh. Yeah, they're, they're like the everything lizard. Yeah. 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 They really everything. are. And they're, they're fascinating because of that. I noticed that heavily as well with the, uh, I'm so bad at Latin. If I haven't heard someone else say it, I always say it wrong. But it's, it's spinulosis. That sounds yeah. right to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I had a small group of those. I had four of them, um, 
and it was very love hate. I, I hated them because the second you open that door, it doesn't matter where the hell they are, they're gone. Yeah. And they're not afraid of you to do it. They'll climb your face. They'll oh, yeah. they'll climb your shoulder. They'll jump over your head. Doesn't matter how big the cage is. They just want to get out and disappear, and it pisses me off. Yeah. Um. But uh, I thought that they were kind of an arboreal lizard. I've seen people give them a lot of height and, and branches and trees and stuff like that. And I was talking to Ryan McVeigh, and he's like, "So what we observed in the wild with them." is a lot of times they use height when they're alarmed and that's how they climb these tall trees and see all their surroundings. And if they're comfortable, they're more so burrowing lizards. So I did deeper substrate and there was a there was a goddamn subway system under the ground. <laughs> that Absolutely. makes sense to me. Absolute yeah. sense. Especially in those if they're um... And they never use their water and then I realized that I had them too hot. So they weren't coming out from underground. And then when I balanced it, they turned into an everything lizard, too. They dig these burrows. They climb up the wall. They'd go for a swim. And they would destroy every inch of a new cage in, like, one night's sleep. Yeah. I want to get... And I'm like, this feels like a blue tail. (laughs) I think uh, a lot of those act like that. I was um, listening to... um having a conversation with um, well I don't think it's any secret Uh, Jordan Russell when he was over there trying to find those things and and bringing them over and uh, the the two guys he was with and uh, how they were trying to bring him to where they were finding these animals and whatnot. and he was talking about just what the terrain was like what the the foliage was like and everything and uh, it was yeah it was kind of not what I thought when I first saw pictures of them. You know, you think this, you think almost like a tree monitor. That's kind of what they look like. But, uh, um, yeah. I, do either of you know the guy that's produced them? Uh, uh, yeah. I've had a, Charlie? Charlie, Charlie Birch? Yeah, he's uh, from Rodent. Yeah, there it is. I, I always forget the name because I don't know him, but I, I thought that was really cool because I just assumed that was a species no one's produced because they're not kept that much. Yeah. So I think I saw, like, I think John, like, shared a picture of the eggs that that guy had gotten, and I thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and then um, Quetzal as well has uh, produced them from yeah. Reptilia Amanda. Who is it? Quetzal. Ah, okay. Yeah, Quetzal was produced yeah. back then as well. Yeah. Um, Grant up here is uh, working he, with the group. He produces everything. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, he's a real person? legend. Who is? What happened? Oh, I think I think um, Chris was saying something. Oh, I just asked what you said. You said somebody's working with a group. Oh, uh, Grant uh, Garrison down here. GX3 Reptiles. I say down here, over here, up here, wherever you guys are at. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, he, I know he uh, – I saw the babies when he got them, and he's raising them up at the shop. Um, so they're they're probably sub adults, if not adults, by now. I haven't seen them in a little bit, but uh, uh, yeah. So hopefully, I regret selling everything that I've ever sold. Yeah, yeah. I man, oh, some of the if I could go back in time to some of the sand monitors I had, um, specific animals. I was about to ask you how you like keeping those. I love them. I they are. They, I, I think I just like that size. That's why I'm, I'm really enjoying the Dorianus, even though I'm terrified of them. <laughs> I don't want to take a bite. Um, but I enjoy that size. Um, and the sand monitors, they're just... They, they're their own thing. They're these, these terrestrials, Popeye-armed, you know, just attitudes. And I've never... I've taken a bite by one. But it's it's a food response type of bite, not a defensive bite, um, not an aggressive bite either to that degree. Um, so they they like to do the whole huff and puff and turn and uh, you know tripod up if you if you give them enough space to do so they'll tripod up. Um, so often when I go in and I the way my cages are built, there's a door and then a the windows in the door, um, but they have to tripod up to see what I'm doing. Unless they're far enough back in the back of the cage. That's yeah. Cool. So now that they, they're they so ready to eat every time I walk in there, 
that I will see the male's head and the female will come up or vice versa. There'll be two faces looking at me out the window, but I know they have to tripod to see out that window. Um, I absolutely love them. They are still my favorite that I've ever kept. The favorite that, that I guess we have access to. I assume there's a few out there that I want to keep um, that I would if given the chance. But. So my, my ignorance was to relate them to Argus monitors. In some respect, I suppose they are, but I've been told keeping them is, is different. They're, they're much less annoying. Uh, for, the, <laughs> for the Argus monitors that I've dealt with, now technically the, the ones that I'm producing are crosses. Uh, so I have two other animals, and I just got two eggs from one of those animals bred to the cross female. So I'm hoping that I can the, the the two other animals have like these deep blood red eyes. Um, so I'm hoping I can work that in and see because I, I wasn't able I'm not able to get those two to breed together. Um, so now I'm I'm working trying to work that red eye concept in. Um, but when I throw the two crosses together, they they. If you could consider animals a bonded pair, it's real obvious that these two are a bonded pair. And they just the way they accept each other, the way they move around each other, our bass together, they do so much together. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting. But as far as keeping them compared to an Argus, I've never kept a straight Argus monitor. But I've been around enough that were, that were big a-holes that uh, they kind of... You know, I, I remember, well, and the other thing I'll say is some of the Argus monitors I see now, they're not as big as the Argus monitors I remember. Like, the Argus monitors yeah. I remember were these five... That's the truth. They're really not. Yeah, they're almost these five, six-foot monsters back in the past, and the ones I see nowadays, they're, they're you know, in that four-foot range. Um, so I don't know if we're just getting them from somewhere different or um, who knows. Yeah, and it's weird. Now, do we, it's weird. That do we have pure sands in the states? I think I always just assumed when they were labeled sands, they were still like a really high percentage of vest. They, they can't. They might be. Um, and I think there's some different indicators that we look for to to kind of say, okay, yeah, this is like the, that blonde tip on the tail, some of the the pattern and coloration, and just the overall size of the animal. Um, and so that's what we kind of take as those indicators that they are a uh, high percentage. Um, now, I, I know my my future babies, if I can get these two eggs to hatch, will be high percentage. Um, but, you know, I, I like to just tell people they're sand monitors, they're crosses. They don't know they're crosses. They're going to give you everything that I ever remember all my sand monitors ever acting like. And yeah. um, one of the things I will say yeah. though, is... When I originally kept them, and I had the the Flavies and Goulds, and I had the um, the crosses, the the crosses that I remember Frank making were some of the most outstanding as far as coloration animals I've ever seen. Like you're talking this, what's supposed to be a desert monitor has these highlighter neon greens on the back of it, and uh, sometimes these neon like reds and oranges come out. And um, fortunately, I, I've get, stayed in touch with some of these people, like uh, Shane Wooldridge up in Washington. He has one of, one of the animals, and for sure, this thing, when it sheds and it has that fresh paint job on there, the, the colors that come out of this thing are just like, you see these kind of like neon greens and uh, this kind of like burnt orange almost come out of the color. It's just an, an amazing animal. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Man, you're killing me now. But I was going to do a, a trade with Alex for some, yeah. and I finally just I, – I think for once I finally called my limit, and I was just like, yeah, I can make this face. I'm like, but I'm just so tired. Yeah. As Kai gaunt. You, 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 sir, are on a mission. <laughs> like, I'm just so tired, man. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are, you are like the Blues Brothers on a mission from God with those Croc monitors. So when you want some sand monitors, I'm not trying to take anything away from Alex. I love his animals and him. Um, but there'll be some at some point, you know. But, uh, but I understand what you're saying fully. It's, ee. there's so. 
And to your to your point on the bite, my worst bite of my life was from a Dorianus Same. 17 years ago, and I still have nerve damage from yeah, it. Yeah, really messed up my finger too. Mine is I still have the scar and everything, and I feel like I feel the bump. Um, yeah, man, Dor- Dorianus was my is my worst bite till today. That's crazy. There's Maybe such- cry. Now I've I've never had a crock bite, and I'll I'll admit it and say that I take some chances that would probably get me what I deserve someday. Uh, but I also never intend to get a crock bite to compare. No, <laughs> I look at the teeth of these things. Like even even tree monitors, I was surprised when I was actually looking at their teeth, what kind of teeth they're equipped with, and then compared to like the sand monitors and. Um, I guess the other large one I'd have would be Savannah monitors. You know, they're kind of uniform, smaller teeth. I still don't want to take a bite from them, but um, I would rather take a bite from those than, from the looks of it, even those tree monitors, un- unless that, that crushing force is a lot more, <laughs> which could very well be the case. But Yeah, I've, I've been chewed on by a couple of trees, and it, it's not pleasant, but it's not the same as something with big, heavy jaws. Yeah. yeah. It slices you up. You bleed pretty good. But. Yeah. Yeah, man. I just, yeah. I, I still, for the most part, when I'm going hands-on, I'm wearing gloves. And I got nothing to prove, and I got a regular job to go to. So <laughs> I'm going to yeah. keep wearing gloves. Uh, especially with those Dorianus. They just, I, it scares me to take a bite. I, I want to work with them. I'm hoping we can get some babies, you know, actually get captive-born babies out into the, the hobby. And I don't know. I It would depend on those individuals at the time if I continue keeping them. They're gorgeous. I love what they do. Uh, I, think, uh, I think my bosses make bets on when I'll come into work missing a finger. So they're looking forward to it. <laughs> They got you like a like on the calendar. Who's got who's got the thirty first? <laughs> uh, that's uh, yeah. that's good stuff, man. So, you know, we we kind of just roundtable in um, some of this. I I already think Chris, if if you're willing to, we'd love to have you back on to get more in depth with um, more like what you're doing specifically, kind of where your head's at when you approach a, a project or animal. But half the time when we first start talking to people, we just talk like this. We're talking, it's kind of scattered. It's all about monitors or all about animals. And, um, but we will jump around so much. I, I tell people sometimes like in messages, yeah, I'll try to stick to a topic more. Cause, uh, some of the keepers out there, you know, the guys listening, they want a, basically a care sheet in, <laughs> in, uh, in podcast form. And I'm like, yeah, I'll try, but that's I don't yeah. know if our our brains necessarily it's too work scripted. like that. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's too scripted. When you're trying to have, it's yeah. just being us, one person talking, it'll just be the same. But uh, like, sure, we try to have somewhat of a topic, and then we work. I mean, talk about the gems. I mean, it's not like you guys didn't get a bunch of gems just dropped in this episode alone, you know. So um, those are also the very important things because. There are key factoring points because a lot of the other information or care sheets, you can kind of put that together yourself. You know, it's not yeah. like we don't want to give you the help, but it's also for like the specific guys that are, you know, like Chris, 20 something years trying and all of a sudden try something that, you know, a couple of us suggested or whatever I suggested him. And, and now, bam, there's like a, he's into the next step. It's, we haven't hatched him yet, but, you know, we're on that road where. The, that next step is very important, you know, and then the very next step after that. So right now he's at the incubation phase and um, just waiting for them to hatch. Now that hatching part may be a whole nother, you know, just because it takes so long. They're a lot different than snakes and, you know, so much can happen in 220 something days if they take that long. And even 170 days, I find a lot can go wrong, you know, and um yeah, man, it's uh, it's, it's speaking of, I don't know how the, the size of these eggs compare to like the Indicus types. Um, the only things I've produced before have been the dwarf monitors, and they've been pretty kind of thin shelled eggs that were easy to candle. Yeah, yeah. these things are thick as hell. I still couldn't huh. figure out anything trying to candle them. Yeah, that's, um, that's I, I don't crazy. know. I'm, I'm pretty sure I thought maybe like two eggs by now. 
Say that again. And if I don't, maybe that's bad. But I also know that bad is also kind of a yellowing, which I've seen in snake eggs that normally go oh, yeah. bad. But I don't have that either. Yeah, it's uh, it's been almost two months. I would say the veins should should have just about started, but I don't know croc eggs, and maybe they take longer. Um, but I would say if you're well into three or four months and you don't see any veins at all, um, not you know, not to say that it's bad, but I would. I would incubate them until they turn black and shrivel up. You know, that's that's my recommendation. Just because I've seen some bad eggs, you know, let's say Gosh. you're not shining the light and that's even bad eggs hatch. Yeah. You know, I've seen them come from a little more. I've had some really ugly yeah, eggs. Oh, yeah. molded, molded eggs, uh, eggs that were half the size of the other eggs. I still have that first one in the incubator in a separate bin that got kicked out of the nest. And I'm like, I know this thing's dead, but I just can't throw right. it away. Yeah. And I think I think that's true for, for most of us. It's like we will not give up until all the other babies have hatched. That one's yeah. covered in black mold or something. You know, it obviously is, is uh, sticky and whatnot. <laughs> and yeah. uh, we, we're still not giving up hope. Uh, but um, the other thing that... And it, that I noticed with the uh, the Crocs or the um, the sand monitors is that um, I have had two week differences between the babies hatching, and I would almost assume with some of the larger eggs you might even get you know a month difference. In fact, uh, there's some people that were, were talking about that recently, where yeah. um, and and the funny thing is uh, even if you're you're incubating at roughly the same temperature. Um, like I think Alex had his sand monitors laid before mine, and then mine laid, and then my eggs hatched before his, and his still went like another something crazy, like 30, 45 days after that before they hatched. So. Oh wow, yeah. it's weird. Really yeah. weird. Quite a quite a bit of a difference with those larger eggs, and with the smaller eggs, it seems like if things don't hatch within a day of each other, there's usually some kind of issue. Um, so. Right. Yeah, it's just it's pretty interesting. I think I can't be, so the when I said that mine are in an incubator with three monitors, it's it's not ones that that I produce, it's ones that they did, but those tree monitor eggs are like the size of the Tristus eggs that I've gotten. That's I nuts. can't believe how small they are. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, I didn't know I don't know firsthand cuz I, I and I'm like, are they always that small? And the last ones that they had that did hash were that small too. I'm like, I can't believe it. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah they're not very big, very big eggs at all. Uh, I need to see some firsthand. I can't wait to. I really want to, but uh, um, you know, there's uh, I, I have the I have greens, blacks, and blues, and um, I'm hoping to see something. The blacks have kind of been iffy for me. The greens have been pretty good, and they're they're actually pretty uh, pretty cool animals to work with uh if i surprise them they'll run off but if i have food and i'm patient they'll come out and eat and then the uh the blues have gotten used to me now that they've been me with me for a while but i need to get something going with them have you produced any of them not yet? one and uh i feel so guilty because the only reason i ask is um we have uh greens blues and yellows here that are theirs. Yeah. And they've gotten the greens to go three times now and not the other ones. So I didn't know if that's just happenstance or if that species for whatever seems easier. It does seem like that's the more common species right. in captivity, but I didn't know if that was just coincidence. I've um, got um, one of their green offspring, and then I have a pair of cordensis. Oh, nice. And I think the cordensis are my favorite. Yeah, that's real nice. I like those a lot. Um but I, I'm telling myself no more until I get something out of some of these, you know. Um, but the I really I really enjoy the attitude of the greens because uh, they're the most sociable right now out of everybody. And uh, but the blues are just they they're always stellar. You know, you just look at them, you're like, wow, those things come in blue. Yeah. It's not like a almost blue, a slate blue. It's like no, those things are blue. And uh, there's one of them I. I I'm looking for some more. I'd like to see a yellow in person that's actually yellow. These ones are like greenish, and I feel like most people's are greenish. Yeah, I feel like they lose them due to diet. It's very possible. Yeah. Yeah, because I've heard like wild caught ones are almost always yellow. Wild caught older animals. Yeah. Interesting. There's like a there's a almost some of them just look much more greener than you 
know, I would, I'm, I would expect to look, you know, I've seen, I've seen some very stellar yellow ones. That's why, you know, where it's, they're, they're definitely, you know, green, black, yellow, and blue and Keith, Keith Horn eye or whatever. Um, yeah, there's all those differences, but yeah, I think the, the tree monitors, the greens, it's not that they're easier. It just, it just seems that the numbers and everything like that have been adding up more more on their side than all the other ones. But I've seen guys that have all three and or all four of them or how many there ever are and produce them all, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it might not really be uh, just because the prasinists are simpler or something. Well, they, they are quite a bit smaller overall than I would say the, the blacks and the blues. Which I didn't know either. I thought they were relatively the same size. And it's hard to judge them sometimes because that tail will curl right in and they're so lanky. But when you actually get them out side by side, I was surprised to see how much of a difference there was in uh, overall. I mean, I'm talking like... I've only had one black and I, I traded it and he was huge. I don't know if he was an exception size animal or if they're just naturally that much bigger, but that thing could have ate my green. Yeah, yeah. The blacks surprised me too. Uh, for whatever reason, I thought they were like the greens or smaller. Um, maybe it's the way they show up in picture just because they're the, that solid color or something. I don't know. But I was surprised that they were basically the same size as the blues. And... Um, and they, they were kind of scary after that. <laughs> you know, I, they kind of intimidated me a, a little bit. And they threw me for some loops. I ended up losing one. Um, and the other two were doing all right. Um, and then I had a... So most of these came in together. Uh, was it last year? Last uh, yeah. September? Yeah, it was last, last September. Year. And... Um, so got them all together, and then two two blues I already had. Um, so I'm still giving them a little time. Um, maybe it's me to figure things out, and um, hopefully we can get something going. I I really want those blues to go. I'm working hard on those things, and uh, they are they used to be real finicky eaters. They would only touch the bugs, and then slowly they've started accepting some other food items on a regular basis now. So I think that's gonna play out in my favor um, and they've, they've kind of gotten used to, when I first got them, they would only drink when being sprayed, now they actually know where the water bowl is, we'll actually go drink out of a water bowl, even though I still do spray them, um, so I think some of it was just that learning process of, for me and for them um, so we'll, we'll see where it all goes uh, and then well, all the other ones. We'll figure those out eventually, too. Like you said, Chris, <laughs> i got to focus on one thing at a time, try to get them on board. And uh, it seems like the Australian stuff always messes it up because they're like, hey, we're going no matter what. And uh, yeah, yeah. you better dig up these eggs because they're coming. <laughs> I, I'm supposed to be chilling mine down, right? Because uh, I've had them lay a, a couple clutches each in the last, um, you know, the, I say the last three or four months. Um, since uh, since since spring, so well, I'm probably now getting closer to five or six months. But I, I didn't want them. I don't want to have them keep going, but they're still going right now, right? So I just I just yeah. dug up a clutch the other day, and I was like, well, do I chill them now or do I wait till dead or winter to do it? But I still technically got a couple months, um, and so right. yeah. I'm good. I'm really debating. So right now I just kicked everybody's heat back up because today was only 70 degrees and um, hoping that, uh, I don't know, whatever I maintain is the right move, you know, shoot. just, uh, just to... So that's, I have that same question. I obviously haven't had the same amount of production success that you have, right. but like I kind of look at these things and I was getting ready to start dropping temperatures and then all of a sudden the Salvador I are locked up and then the melon is recording and that's all good stuff. But I'm like, when does this stop so that I can start over? Yeah, and yeah. You, you when, decision. if it's not working, do I give up so that I can start over? I guess like, this is what I was, talking just to always Asher about. I was talking to Asher about this exact thing. And I basically told him that you have to make a decision. It's yeah. your, your, you're going to, cause you technically control food and you know, all that stuff. And sure. That's not exactly what I mean, but it's, it's, um, you starting to 
realize, okay, how long have they been going? Have they been breeding and laying, you know, six, seven clutches or how many ever clutches do you think is a lot? I think three or four is plenty for my animals, right? They don't lay a lot of eggs. And if you space it out, you know, four or five, let's just say four clutches every 60 days. And they can kind of go a little sooner, but let's just say 60 days, right? Um, that's, a, that's you know, a few months already. That's several months already. And that, that, that means that they've been going for a long time. Um, technically, more than half the year, they've been breeding, recouping, burning energy, you know, developing follicles, all that stuff like that, right? And so if you calculate the time of when you started or when they started the whole cycle, right? And it's going to take up whole mo- a bunch of months, right? So let's just say we started in, um, we started in April. Right, because let's say you you kind of gave them a cooling period during winter time, and you started in in April as that's when you warmed everything back up. You have a lot more food, right? And every high humidity is high, and they technically are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're breeding, they're laying, you're getting eggs, or or the process of the female laying, you know, going through the whole process, and then she does it again in another two months, and then two more months she does it again right and so let's say that's just three alone that's easily six seven months already and let's add a fourth one on there you know with another 60 days man that's another month and a half ish right so um almost two more months that they've been going and now you've added up all those months bam they've been basically going all year almost and that's when i descend again decide to now we're gonna give them a chill Mm-hmm. Feed them moderately, nothing crazy for them to start developing follicles or us- utilizing that fat. Um, and then uh, taking the heat and humidity down and basically taking them down like you would North American colubrids or tortoises or whatever else you're breeding that would normally take take a brumation period, right? And I'm just giving them a chill. They're, they're, they're kept at much cooler temperatures for months, you know, two or three months at the minimum. Um, and I've gone as long as four months with keeping them and only maintaining their food like once a week. And it's just l- l- very lean stuff. Um, so that's what I felt like doing because, well, obviously making them burn fuel and lay and lay and lay all year round was just going to kill them sooner you know um so we, we didn't we didn't so do you kind of make those calls based on like recovery and body composition too um like um i do sometimes that yeah. was kind of a hard thing to adapt to for lizards with me because snakes for the most part breed once per year and a lot of things we give every other year off yeah so i'm like what do you mean it's laying every two months? Yeah. Like that doesn't seem good. And then I kind of feel like, and then I kind of find that it's normal. So I, I started to kind of try to wonder like, at what point is that dictated otherwise? So like if I look at a snake and I had a really rough recovery, it's getting that year off. If it's a young female that bounced back immediately and had a nice, a nice clean clutch, like we, we might go again next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, so I didn't know if they kind of got looked that way and something like the salvadori being so big and those giant eggs like can those females even produce that often if we wanted them to i don't know anybody who's done it repetitively right. I, I i think it's possible uh, i think at least two to three months possibly you know where it's gone 60 to 90 days um and that's the more average time frame if you're you know not pumping and you know stuff like that i think and maybe the species you keep isn't so prolific. I mean, some are, you know, Aki's 40 days. <laughs> They're already, yeah. you know, laying another clutch. It's less than 60 days. So uh, it, they can go really fast. I mean, it does put a lot on the female, but I've seen it done. You know, I've seen it where people are just producing things. And then there's stuff like what I have where, sure, it's not six, seven, eight clutches. It's more like four or five eggs every 60 days something like that that's kind of what i've been dealing with Um, my most prolific in like egg production was last year and each female that i had would just drop eggs not even drop eggs actually lay them whether they were fertile or not and just you know 
that's that's the thing that I've noticed with a lot of mine, and it's like, well, okay, I didn't introduce, I took the mail out, I tried to cut you back, I tried to cut lights down, and you still laid eggs. So, what are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me you're going to do it regardless, unless you're completely cold and, and really can't move around? Um, so, and then, what is what is healthier at that point, you know? Um, or are you going to reabsorb some things, or are they actually just going to hold on to eggs? And then when seasons are right, can they hold on to eggs that long? And basically, almost like the egg doesn't activate until they actually decide that they're going to lay them. Are, they, are, are we putting them down for cooler periods sometimes where they're actually have vital eggs that will come out at some I don't know. There's a lot of stuff I don't know yet, and I'm not... As horrible as this sounds, I almost wish we had the opportunity to really look inside, but unless you're cutting animals open, you can't really... Even on an ultrasound, you can only tell so much about what's going on inside. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're just not there yet with that kind of knowledge, but it's... it's uh, oh! Do you guys use ultrasound for much? I feel like I saw you post an image, Kai. I didn't know if that was routine. Uh, or I have it. Issue. I've actually recently just fumbled back with it again. I forget that I have one. Um, but uh, it it takes multi because of the females. It takes multiple hands, you know, and it's really just me and Lynn. And so let's say if I, I'm I'm holding the monitor, right? She's got the 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 ultrasound probe or whatever and the reader um and she's already hands full with that and then holding the thing and then we have to kind of get used to pressing the buttons and figuring out which is which so that and really getting a good image and what i'm really looking at i I haven't been able to get much successful usage out of it we've just really been learning it i cody reminded me that i had one the other day because he he has a vet come through and um yeah, I just realized, all right, I'm going to see now because all these females are going through these stages right in front of me, and I am I can already tell what they're going through just by their, their behavior, right? So I guess that's why I don't really use it because I can I, I know my animals pretty well, but it would be great to see them going through vitiligenesis, whatever. Like I have a female now. I posted a picture of her and she's got her belly hanging and she's got her back end on a cork and then her head like literally wedged in between the partition and her belly is just hanging right and it's really uncomfortable uh, it looks like to me right she's she could just hang herself um and uh yeah I just i can pull her out and and do that whole thing but man i need like a third fourth person um maybe at least six hands the the person literally working the monitor and having that yeah work with because i can't really do much i'm holding the monitor still you know i might be able to dump some petroleum jelly or whatever they use and you know we can try to run at it again but yeah it's uh having a, another set of hands helping out with the monitor the i'm sorry the actual like scanner and reader thing that's uh you know, that's that's where we need uh, I need assistance with. But yeah, man, I don't. I've gotten crummy pictures from it, and um, it's it's one that is recommended by Nerd and a couple of the guys that were working there showed me what they got. So I, I got the identical thing, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I don't know. I saw what what I'm looking at to be um, ovum or, or or you know the little follicles that are kind of developing in a row but um when someone when i looked up images of someone else's they're they're a lot different maybe these were at a very young stage and they're so uniform or maybe i wasn't getting the right image but i've seen others where they're just a bunch of clusters right next to each other you know yeah Um, yeah yeah just uh i I, know people have to go to school just to train for some of that stuff (laughs) yeah yeah and i was over here like bugging everybody like hey uh, how do you how do you work this you got any images you know and asking people that are like vet techs or or people and i even asked uh i asked eric right and um he he doesn't he doesn't really know how to work one either so um yeah it's just uh it's difficult it's for sure for sure something that like someone else has to really know what they're talking about to show you what 
what to look for and how to use this machine and all those things added up and really don't really work in my favor. <laughs> oh, I meant to share real quick. I know we're getting close to two hours, but um, uh, that that Kimberly, I was having an issue uh, with a Kimberly that just seemed to all of a sudden one of my males uh, shriveled up as far as its tail, as far as the like uh, muscle tone around its um, its its limbs, but the body was still staying real full. And uh, so it would go back and forth. It seemed to recover sometimes, and then it would drop off again, recover, and then drop off again. So I ended up making the decision where I'm going to cull this animal and put it out of its misery. So I did that, and as soon as I made that decision, I also cut that animal open to see what was going on inside. And I just want to share this with the uh, the listeners out there. What I found was um, a basically intestinal tract that was just jam-packed full. So the thing was impacted. But I also went ahead and cut that track open to see what exactly was in there that impacted it. And there was nothing really that I could find out at all that wouldn't pass through this animal. And so I was trying to figure out what happened to this animal. And uh, the other day I was talking to, to actually Shane, and uh, he listened to what I was saying, and uh, he, he said basically it was, a, uh, it was a stone, it was a mineral build up basically in your animal because right I, I would say two weeks prior to culling this animal I had um, felt something really hard down towards its uh, opening basically and so I was working it out I was um, pressing on it and then I was able to pinch the tail uh, base and with my thumb press this thing out and it hit the ground it sounded like a marble um, so I, at first I thought it was just a stuck urate that really dried out inside the body or something like that. And I didn't pay too much attention to it, but I did save that. I don't know why, because I'm a weirdo. I put it in a little cup I had. And um, so I looked at it uh, last night, and for sure it's like this little stone, you know. And uh, so um, I wanted to kind of share this with everybody, because with the Kimberleys, I, we've talked before about the, the integrity of the eggs and um, losing females to uh, calcium deficiencies and whatnot. So I basically decided I'm supplementing everything um, that they eat. But where I've ne- I haven't noticed it in any other animals, is it possible in some of these slender body animals that we're basically over, over supplementing with that calcium supplement? where they're not processing it the right way, especially in the males, because the females have somewhere to put it, but the males might not have somewhere to put it. Anyways, I don't know what the reality of that is or, or how, that's just my initial thoughts. I just wanted to share that with everybody, um, kind of go off that uh, off topic a little bit, but, uh, but get that out there as I'm kind of like seeing these problems come up and, um, and it'll make more sense. I think this was on the last episode that hasn't even hit yet that we recorded where I talked about this sick Kimberly but uh, this is the follow up of what, what basically came of that and I did see one of those stones so I don't know if it was already at that point the animal itself was too far gone I don't know if I could have really done anything to to get ahead of that or help that um, with the knowledge I had then but now I'm going to maybe take a different approach it's hard to if you have animals grouped together to feed one one thing and one another thing, so yeah. how do we uh, how do we adjust for that? And uh, especially in the dwarf monitors, I, I think maybe with the larger monitors it might be a little easier because I'm able to feed those whole prey items where they're getting maybe a more balanced overall. But with um, they're, I mean they're still eating crickets and stuff, but. I think maybe maybe I can somehow cut back the calcium that the males consume, but this is only one animal, one instance among lots of animals. So, uh, what about have you guys ever experienced something like that, where that an animal, like their tail base, just shrivels up within like a week of seeing it? Yeah, yeah. I've had it where uh-huh. animals whack their tail and that part is becomes dead, or I've seen it constricted. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've had, I've had it, uh, where, yeah, and I, what I did was just snip it. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just snipped I, it as it was. I've things like that before. Yep. 
But yeah, this is the first one I had where an animal is kind of like holding on, kind of like the zombie animal where it looked like it wanted to recover and then it would start failing again. And of course, it's not really pooping anything out, so I started soaking it in warm water to try to help it poop because I wasn't noticing it poop in its cage enough. And uh, But come to find out, it was just like... <laughs> This track, if you imagine a Kimberly's body, is about the, the length of the entire body inside, and it was just pretty thick in there. Uh, Holy crap, yeah, literally. How impacted it was, and uh, Jeez. Um, yeah, it, it was pretty crazy, you know. And here I am thinking it needs more sustenance because it's not getting something, obviously, because it's its tail think, and base and everything. But I think what yeah. uh, remember I think I mentioned in the when we were chatting earlier. I think we got to start doing professional necropsies at the vet. Uh, yeah. That way we can at least get the the numbers down on, you know, the blood work, right? Because then we can start putting more evidence towards what possibly happened, you know? Um, not that it's going to, they're going to for sure find, but they'll be able to tell you that, you know, there's this scientific name to this thing, and, you know, however, whatever right. the details are. Um at and that's what more possibly around it. It's like they, they had, let's say you have high numbers in something, and I, I actually don't even know what to choose and what have it make sense. But let's say high numbers in something else affecting your kidneys, and or yeah. I don't know, just things like that, right? And uh, I, uh, I, my last one, my last little at home neck necropsy was Athena, man, and I just. Uh, as soon as I pulled her from the enclosure, I was like, you know, she's full of eggs. She's been trying to get them out. Maybe they're alive and well, but um, they should have been out of her a week or two ago because yeah. of how they looked, you know? Yeah. Um, there was this one, I think it was uh, maybe an old, old uh, uh, follicle that basically partially developed and then that one was in the way of everything else, right? Huh. And it was bloody like like it itself ruptured and um it wasn't fully developed but when i cut it open it was all orange and yellow inside you know interesting i'm pretty sure yeah so oh wow um yeah and then i i uh i <coughs> pulled out the eggs <laughs> that were good and they were they were like they were decomposing already inside or over even so though they're rotting yeah, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, it was um, such a bummer, man. Um, and what's weird is I have a I have a clutch from her sitting right here, right right next to me right now. Um, her, la her, la her last last clutch. So um, yeah. hopefully those hatch, and uh, we uh, you know say say goodbye to the Partho project for now yeah. until until another one starts to lay parthenogenic eggs, but. Everybody that lays so far, I don't think any of them are parthenogenic at all. Um, yeah, they just they just lay a bunch of good looking eggs. They go part of the distance and then they fail. You know, like three months and then they start to turn colors. <coughs> so yeah, we're right about that, Mark. Chris, we would love to have you on again if you'd like to come on and uh, talk some more because I feel like we can cover so much. We we can start talking to other monitor keepers and monitor lovers, and it's just like you know, we. we yeah, yeah, man, definitely. Awesome, awesome. So uh, we will um, uh, wrap this up for now for this one. But, yeah, I want to get back to this uh, pretty quick, so we'll, we'll talk afterwards. Um, but, anyways, uh, Chris, where can people find you? Chris, do you want people to find you? <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> No, pretty pretty much everything I post is uh, is just on my own Facebook. Um, I have an Instagram that's the Amethystina Project, right. which is for scrub pythons, but I've backed off of scrubs a little bit, and I thought of just kind of telling all those followers that they're going to have to live with me sharing everything on that page and still keeping yeah. the scrub python no, name. That makes sense. <laughs> it's too much work sometimes. <laughs> um, and then the... Uh, and then that um, uh, monitor lizards and custom right. enclosures group. I, I post a lot of stuff in, and I'm sure there's a lot of good groups out there. I just yeah, there's so many, stuff. and then there's so much. Not even the drama, right? There's the limitations to to those groups. It's like, you know, you can only say so much, and 
I don't know, no free thinkers. Just <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. So there's along with yeah. the just drama, I just can't really. Yeah, on some of the groups, I really only post on one, maybe two groups, and I've had to like you know tell people I don't want to mod their group or you know just yeah. It's there's just so many groups, so many. Yeah. All right, Kai, where can people find you? Um, yeah, you can find me on mostly on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram as well under big underscore lizard 103. Um, you're able to find me on YouTube under Mangrove Mecca. Um, and you can find me under here, the Morelia Python Network under uh, Monitor Keeping Podcast. Nice. And, uh, yeah, I'm most responsive on Facebook though under Kai Fan. So. Yeah. yeah, you guys can you can find me on uh, Instagram at Origins underscore Reptile, and then uh, on Facebook at Origins Reptile. And of course, like Kai said here on the Monitor Keeping Podcast. And uh, with that, we just want to let you guys know. Of course, we're brought to you by Morelia Python Radio and the network. Um, so. If you guys aren't familiar with them, which everybody should be at this point, because they're going to have a podcast for you covering what you're into. Uh, but a great bunch of guys that are, are on those shows. Uh, Eric is a great guy for being able to bring this all together and uh, put all this information together it's somewhere that it's easy to find. So you can go onto their website, um, check it out. You can also email them, info at moreliapythonradio.com, if you have any other questions to them. Uh, for the show info, you can search Morelia Python Radio on Instagram or Facebook. You can even find them on YouTube under that same name. Um, so just give them give them a, a look. Look over and see if you're into rat snakes, to boas, to geckos, to field herping, to who knows what. If, if I think they have pretty much everything covered at this point. So uh, And you can scroll through the descriptions of those episodes and handpick which ones you want. I mean, if you like to binge stuff, there's hours and hours. If you have a, a job or a situation that allows you to, some great information in there. So um, thank you guys for listening, and hopefully we'll see you back here soon with, uh, with another episode. All right.